and I'll share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see a screen with a mouse going in circles there. See, si, senor. All right, perfect. So first part's gonna be very, very quick. Uh, again, just review from last time. So um, we'll go quickly up to the point where we left off and then we'll slow down a little bit. Okay, so we're all talking about uh, control loop interaction, of course. Uh, and talking about multivariable using two or more PV inputs to affect the action of the system. And the strategy that we ultimately are developing here is designed to eliminate the interaction that one loop has when it changes the effect it has on the other one and vice versa. Okay, and then we talked about interaction between loops and whether you can determine whether or not there's interaction. And then we talked about two types of multivariable strategies and we had a quick slide on centralized control that took all the inputs uh, into one controller and then um, manipulated them and put out a signal. And then we moved on to the majority of the ILM, which was based on decoupling control. So this was uh, decentralized where we got the two different measurements going into the same controller and then uh, outputs coming out. And we started talking about decoupling and all of its little things here. So um, <clears throat> starting out with the calculations here, calculating the severity of loop interaction. And then from that, we get the compensation factors in order to achieve decoupling. So we look at the process variables and the controlled variables. So the process variables here, PV1 and PV2, and the controlled variables, CO1 and CO2. And by, by uh, configuration here, this system has two controlled variables, two manipulated variables, thus we call this a two by two system. And as a result, we get a two by two matrix. And yes, they can be bigger than two by two, but thankfully we only deal with two by two. And that is why we end up with a two by two scale here. So in order to develop the relative gain metrics, we have to start a matrix. We have to start out with an open loop matrix. So the open loop matrix is found by determining the uh, static gains of the individual loops in comparison. So that was the testing we did where we made a 10% change in the uh, CO1 and then we recorded the output uh, effect on PV1 and PV2. And then we put them over top of each other using the output over input formula and then it gave us values uh, individual static gain values to plunk into this here formula. Then we take this here formula and it gets converted into the relative gain matrix here, which is filled in by taking the numbers from up here, plunking them into the uh, associated formula here. So for 11 and 22, for these two, we use this formula, plugging in the numbers. And for 12 and 21, we use this formula, plugging in these numbers. Okay, so again, getting the, getting the values for our static gains again, we make a change in controller one, and then we measure how much it affected PV1, and we measure how much it affected PV2, and then we put them over each other, and that gets us our KP11, KP12, KP21, and KP22 values. So you do it first with one controller, uh, and then you do it with the other controller. Okay, so... Uh, again, looking at the PVs and the uh, manipulated variables here are the control outputs. This is where we're getting that data from. So a uh, little bit of a complicated example to give in the ILM here. Uh, previously, they used a simpler, uh, simpler example, uh, and they walked all the way through it to, to get the numbers here. And this is from the ILM. Um, they just don't really show you the steps on how you get there, and it's really not that important. Um, for the math, as long as you know that it's essentially output over input. <clears throat> okay, so the ILM drive these values here. So, of course, we take these values down and we plunk them into the related uh, formula in order to get the uh, relative gain matrix values to put into, uh, into its own grid. So, again, we run through the one calculation. We get one number, and then we simply subtract that number from one and that gives us the other number. So kaboom, you're, you're done 
basically at that point. Okay, uh, this is another example. Um, this one here is very similar to the example in the self-test. Um, so I wanted to include this, but you had a good idea of what the wording would look like in a, in a type of question uh, and how you would actually get it there using some simpler values uh, than the ILM gives you in the uh, objective section here. So develop an OLM and an RGM, determine the best pairing to minimize interaction for a two by two system from the following results. So here's where we did our little test. Uh, controller two is being held constant. Um, and then we do a 10% change in CO1. We did that 10% change in CO1 and it caused a 7% change in PV1 and a 6% change in PV2. So here we did that. 10% change, we did a 10% change in both tests with both controllers, so 10% will be common. Um, but in the first uh, first loop here, so controller one, PV1, controller one, PV2. So we do the output change, six over 10 gives us 0.6. And the other output change here, 7%, 7% over 10 gives us 0.7. And we dump them into our grid here. So one and one is PV1 with controller one. So that goes in here, one and one. And then uh, 2, 1 here, 2, 1, 0.6 goes in that square there. And then the associated math uh, with the other half of the test generated the same way. And those numbers go into the open loop matrix grid. From the open loop matrix grid, then, of course, we take these numbers and we plunk them into the associated formula to get our relative gain matrix numbers here. And so I've done that, substituting the numbers from the previous example into here, and we run them out using the 1122 formula here, and we get 0.327. Okay, we subtract that number from one, and that gives us 0.67. Those are the two numbers that we get to put into our relative gain matrix. Then we go for the closer to one uh, pairing thing here. So the way that's done the ILM is they take the number from the pairings here, so 1 divided by 3.33 gives us a number of 3.03. .03. We do the other number, 1 divided by 0.67, and we get 1.49. What these numbers represent is the dynamic gains of the interaction. So we do a change on one of the controllers. It affects the other by a factor of 3. We do a change on the other pairing, and it affects the other by a factor of 1.49. So the idea is, is that you want to select the pairing that gets you a gain value that's closest uh, to 1. So in this case, 1.49 is obviously closer than 3. It also happens to work out with these two numbers as well. Okay, um, another thing that you have to be aware of is that these columns and rows have to equal 1. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, so with that, once you figure out that you know, the six, seven, so controller two with process variable number two, like what exactly are you going to select? Um, you're going to, you, this, the relationship between these two, I guess, is, is not just coincidental. When you, when you do the math one way or the other, the bigger number out of this pairing is going to give you a lower number here. So really you're picking, the, you're picking the bigger pairing. So basically your choices are going to be PV2, and uh, CO2 kind of thing. You're looking for you're looking for the number that gets you closer to the one. So CO1 uh, with PV2 is 0.67. So I use that pairing, or alternatively, the CO2 pairing with PV1, which is also the 0.6 number, a uh, 0.67 number. So closest to one, either here or there, or there is basically what you're looking at. I think the ILM is more. I think the ILM is more focused on this pairing, this right. number. And you being able to say, well, if they say, what pairing are you going to pick? You're going to pick the pairing that has the highest numbers. And in this case, it's controller one with PV2 or controller two with PV1. Oh, okay. So then controller one will will uh, will control uh, PV2, and then controller two will control PV1. Like, like yeah. I'm just thinking out in the field, like once you have these numbers, then what you're programming into the controller, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, this is just a, this is still, this is still just measuring really the level of interaction, right? Right, and, and then from here, then we get into the 
uh, we get into the transfer functions for the for the loops and applying all the stuff that's done inside the controller that's directly related to the decoupler, uh, and that's where you get your lead time lag cam and all that stuff that we're going to be building up to. Okay, copy that. Okay, again, that's really it's it's next it's it's another week's worth of a course to get into the depth that you're that you're asking about here. So I, I really don't know what to say about it. Don't worry about it too much. Our expectations are distinguish distinguish the severity of the interaction here and that's kind of where we're at okay so what does that mean here uh relative gains in the matrix are the ratio of the open loop gain to the closed loop gain again the 670 is used to tell us how the other one responds on auto um so again i said this on the last slide if we do that math it says the other loop increases by this factor the other one increases by this factor overall we want the, the least gain or closest to one and that's how we end up choosing the pairing then the next slide goes on to show you the relationship between uh, having a, a relative gain matrix where the pairings are, are one or zero. Uh, I'm not going to reread that uh, to you guys here, but again, the goal is to get closest to one. And you'll see as you go through the IRMs, and this is, of course, uh, generally ideal, but you'll figure that out. Okay, then that leads us into decoupling control strategy. We know what the interaction is between the two of them, so we end up getting these kind of factors. We know that one affects this one by three, and this one affects this one by one, so there's obviously some math that we can use to calculate the values to put in here in order to minimize the effect of one change on the other loop. So that gets us uh, going into the next section there. So common applications for decoupling, again, temperature processes, mixing processes, reactor processes. Uh, you can read about them on pages 11 to 14. And then we got up to, uh, I think we made it past here, and we're showing you a complicated version of the decoupler and all the effects that are shown in the loop with the, the, block, the block diagram here. Um, and here we're showing block for the process and a block for the decoupler. So the decoupler process is represented by D1 and D2. Uh, which is some relatively simple math that goes into here. We've done that math to get us up to this far. Um, we haven't done the math to get us up to this far, um, but what this is representing is the uh, characteristics of the processes themselves, uh, the, the transfer equations that happen that have to be compensated for uh, that end up becoming components of the signal going out to the, uh, to the system here. So these numbers, are again process related, related to the reactions of tests done. Uh, again, PV1 controller one, PV1 controller two, PV2 controller one, PV2 controller two, et cetera, et cetera. We get these values. Uh, we don't get into it super heavy. There's one example in the ILM. Um, ultimately, what we're getting up to here is figuring out what we need to do there. Okay, uh, so we start out with these charts just like we did last year that's how we get the transfer functions here um controller output change 10 percent controller change here 10 percent that gives us a gain of one uh here we get a 10 percent change here we got a 15 percent change that gives us a gain of 1.5 and then again draw your line your intersecting line your dots your 63.2 percent dot get all your values to fill in the transfer function and then the process for finding the lead time, lag time, and dead time setting. So this was pretty messy last time, uh, not as messy hopefully this time, but I color coded these arrows. Hopefully that this will make some sense for you, but gains are divided as they are, meaning the upper gain is divided by the lower gain. So the top one over the bottom one, as we see the arrows here, the T1 times down here get flipped. T1s get flipped, so the top one goes to the bottom, the bottom one goes to the top. Not a great example because they're the exact same number in this case, but in any other case, they would be obviously flipped. And then the dead times are subtracted top first, so minus 2.4 minus 2. So 2.4 minus 2, and then we end up getting our values. Uh, I haven't added into this slide the reason why there's no uh, lead time and lag time required in this example, but it has to do with them being such a small amount of time that it doesn't really make a difference and they kind of cancel themselves out. 
Um, same idea then when we're doing D2. So the D1 formula is this formula. The decoupler 2 formula is this formula. The only difference is, of course, the combination of um, process variables and controllers that are used in the formula. So again, we did that test. We got these numbers. We got the transfer functions out of them, and then we're doing the same thing. So 0.8 over 1.5. Uh, this one here you see crisscross, so 1 plus 7 on the top, 1 plus 5 on the bottom, and then 2.8 minus 2 here. That gets us all these wonderful numbers. Our dead time, or sorry, our gain is the 0.53 value. Um, then our lead time is the top value here, the lag time is the bottom value here, and our dead time is this value here. So these ultimately end up being the settings that we put into decoupler 2. These are things that would get put into decoupler one. Okay, that was basically where we left off last time, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> and that takes us into block diagrams and repetitive math here, but I've tidied it up a little bit. So the idea again block behind block diagrams is for us to be able to better understand uh, how the signal travels how it gets modified from its input value uh, to the controller to how it ultimately affects the process after it goes through the valve, goes through the dynamics of, of the process, what happens to it um, before we get our measurement back again on the next cycle. Okay, so if we were to follow uh, the controller output signal through here, and there's good reason why I'm putting this here because uh, I would expect you to be able to understand this. So the change in controller one, let's follow the signal, gets multiplied by the gain value that we've calculated here. So GV1 represents the gain value that was represented by the, the bell itself. Then the signal goes through GN11. It also goes through GN21, but we will uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Goes through GN11, it gets the gain value that's represented from the transfer function, the dynamic function of the process, and then gets moved into this summing block over here. And we'll talk about the summing block again in a second. The signal carries on and then gets through to GT1 or the gain of the transmitter, which is down here. That ultimately ends up giving us our PV1. The signal also, however, comes out of controller one goes through GV1, splits off, goes to GN21, which is the decoupling value that we're going to sum up with the signal from controller two in order to get rid of the interaction. This is the multiplier that basically adjusts this signal, multiplies it by this value, puts it over here, so that when it gets added together, it doesn't change um, its process variable. So again, Signal goes through here, GN21 into the summing block, and then of course out of the summing block through the transmitter gives us our new process variable and then back to the controller and the processor repeats again. So that's the way the signal travels. Okay, uh, luckily we take this here, big blob of stuff, and we smoosh it down into GP. So you see the variables change. We have a GT for transmitter, GB for valve, GN. Uh, representing the, the, the process here. We simplify the block diagram and now we have GP. This represents the entire process, so the transmitter the valve, uh, the dynamics of the process altogether um, represented in this simpler block diagram. Okay, so GPXX, uh, controller one, PV1, controller one, PV2, same thing as the previous slide, only simplified. Okay, so then we look. I saw uh, your page uh, textbook, page 19, the subscription is GN instead of GP. Which, uh, which diagram you refer to on the uh, individual learning module? This one, are you talking about the slide on yeah, the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shows the, yeah, GN, yes. So, GN, But you also show the GP, isn't it? 
not in the same not in the same graph. So if I take okay. all of these if I take all of these components and I smush them together, right? So this is the transmitter gain, the valve gain, and the process gain. If I smoosh them all together, this is just simplified. All of those values are in here. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so this so this GP is equal to GN times GT times GV. Oh, That's gotcha. Just, okay. okay. Okay, so then what does that mean to us? Well, we've got our values from our uh, relative gain matrix, open loop matrix here, those values. These are the same, same values. All we're doing is we're substituting them into the formula for the decouplers. So the decoupler formula is PV2 with controller one and controller two, and decoupler two is PV1 with controller two and controller one. So take those values, sub them out. So uh, 21 over 22, so 0.25 over 0.5 for D1, and 12 over 11, so 15 over 17 for D2. And we do the simple math there, and these are our decoupler values. And you can see the decoupler values transferred in over here. Okay, D2 for controller two, D1 for controller one. So pretty simple math at this point. Okay, that is for the dynamic decoupler. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, or for the static decoupler, fine. Dynamic decoupler isn't really any more challenging. Uh, same math as earlier using the formulas below. As you notice, the same formulas here. Um, I'm not going to go over it again for you guys. This is um, same math as we did on the previous on the previous slides here. Okay, these GPs are um, same. Okay, uh, methods for tuning again. Uh, all these different processes are slightly different, but have very similar basic traits in terms of what we have to do. Uh, so loop interaction affects tuning in different two in two different ways. Uh, first, there's the interaction between the loops when they're in auto. So I guess what we're trying to say is a, a loop behaves differently when it's in automatic than it does when it's in manual. As a result of that difference in behavior, there's also different transfer functions associated with being in manual or with being auto. If the transfer functions are different, then the loop gain is going to change. Okay, That's ultimately what it, what it comes down to. Okay, so with tuning, we want to be able to balance the performance of robustness and the behavior of the manipulated variables. We want them to perform, obviously, incredibly well when they're in auto, but we also want them to be able to work while they're in manual. Um, and tuning uh, has an effect on that. So what is the big things here with tuning decoupling? Uh, some elements of different tuning techniques that we've talked about earlier. So this uh, tune faster loops first with the other loops in manual. This is a characteristic that we talked about in cascade control, uh, which carries over to here. So tuning the faster loops first, then it says tune the slower loops next in order of importance with most important last. Um, I'm not going to expect you to to be able to walk through this step by step. I'm not going to give you uh, a list of, of steps and expect you to fill in the blanks kind of thing. Um, but some of the general high points, I guess, is what we're really concerned about here. OK, um, the relative gain is less than 1. Uh, this is an important point here. And then there's a slide that we'll look at in a little bit that will uh, relate to this. The relative gain is less than 1. You are requested to multiply the proportional gain of the controller by the relative gain after tuning a loop. And we'll talk about why that happens afterwards. Um, after you tune the loop, place it back in automatic. So uh, again, without doing this a bunch of times, uh, it's not going to make a whole bunch of sense uh, for you. Um, if you get the opportunity down the road, you have the books, you can look at them and, and you can give it a try. Um, if you get a chance in the lab, again, you'll be able to give it a try and it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay, so uh, next few slides just show you kind of what happens um, with and without decoupling and when, you're, uh, when your uh, loop gain is 
is greater than or is less than one. So the first one here, uh, this is a set point change and the reactions of the two loops when we do not have any decoupling. So here's a set point change on loop one. So we made a step in the set point on loop one or controller one, it stepped up. And we have a response uh, from PV2 and we have a response from PV1. So obviously no decoupling at all there because the change in the one controller had a, had a change in both variables. The, the least you would expect is to have one of the variables stay steady. That's the, that's the whole point of decoupling. So that's what it looks like without decoupling. A change in either one of the controllers is going to have a change on both of the PVs. Okay, uh, tuning with decoupling, basically same tuning rules as without decoupling, uh, except you're using the transfer function values that we produced uh, in open loop to calculate the decoupling values. And then we go on to talk about if we're using uh, this particular internal model uh, tuning method, which you guys know nothing about at this time, which is unfair, but um, it's mentioned here, but if, uh, if we are using the IMC tuning method, a new transfer function needs to be produced for the second loop, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, you'll learn more about this internal model uh, tuning later. But again, these are specific characteristics for tuning uh, multivariable loop. Okay, so here we have set point changes with decoupling. So here we make a uh, set point change in controller two, little step in controller two here. Um, and you'll see now that we take this number by controller two, and I don't know what number this is, but let's, uh, this is 10% here. So I don't know, this is two or 3%. The output of controller two goes to the decoupler. It gets multiplied by a variable and it still affects controller one, right? So that decoupling value multiplied 3% times whatever that is. It's obviously less than one because this value is lower. But as a result of changing the output of controller, uh, of con changing the output of controller two, it's got a new steady state PV based on that change. But you'll notice that PV1 remained at steady state. So there's no interaction between the two controller values. Uh, look in the other direction here again, making a change in the other controller. You'll see that the PV related uh, to that controller made its change, found a new steady state, and there was no effect on other process variable. So both of these represent decoupling, whereas this one, of course, changing both process variables, no decoupling whatsoever. So these are both pretty good responses, right? The, this is kind of quarter amplitude-ish. This is kind of more like a critically uh, or an overdamped type response. Both of them are acceptable depending on your uh, process conditions. What's not acceptable is this one here. Uh, this is what happens uh, when they're talking about, where was that? Uh, relative gain less than one, you have to multiply the proportional gain. If you don't do that, this is what ends up happening here is that you get these process oscillations in your um, in your PV here. So we made a change in controller two. Uh, the gain was too aggressive, obviously, and we ended up getting oscillations. So if we multiply it um, by the other relative gain, it will reduce this value and it will get us closer to this type of response. And there's a lot of words that are associated with that, but that's that's the ultimate uh, that's the ultimate gain uh, ultimate expectation of what they're trying to say here in these pages 35 to 39. <clears throat> then on the very, very very last page here we talk real briefly here about using function blocks uh, to configure a decoupling strategy in a PLC. Uh, we're not going to get into this uh, obviously uh, very heavily. I'm just kind of showing it uh, to you guys. This is very representative of a delta, uh, delta V type function block diagram here showing our uh, analog inputs, our uh, analog outputs, some math blocks here, and a controller or a decoupler block here, D1 and D2. And here you have our gain values that we've calculated using those uh, mu formulas, mu 11, 12, 21, 22, and calculating our gain 
our lead time, um, lag time, and dead time. All those values get put into into function blocks in the PLC. Next level stuff. If you ever get there, you'll be taking another course. Uh, don't worry about it. But uh, when you do it, all of this stuff, of course, has to be configured from addressing of your inputs to addressing of your outputs, uh, assigning memory to uh, summing blocks, instance names, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here. So this is a good example of a uh, instance instance name or instance instantiation uh, and when you set up the database and you'll do this when we get to the lab you set up the database here you'll you'll put in a tag number that you want it to be ac100 then you'll assign it to uh, an analog input card with an address and then any future programming that you have to do you just type in the tag name and it it automatically knows all the stuff in the memory location that's associated with that tag name all right uh, moving on here, um, next level stuff here, but in any case, the design must address the following issues and a bunch of wonderful terms um, that you probably remember from last year about to come back up again here, but we have to be able to address um, manual operations. So it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really show it here, but we have to have an auto manual switch, right? If it's not a physical switch, uh, it's gotta be a, a switch, a button on the PLC or on the screen. Uh, that, that you have to press, so you have to be able to move them between automatic and manual. Uh, you're not always going to have them running in auto, uh, shutdowns, startups, things like that. You typically start up in manual and then switch them over to auto once everything is kind of caught up. Um, so you have to have a provision for that. With, built up within that provision, of course, is bumpless transfer. The, the purpose of bumpless transfer, again, is to make sure that your controller outputs uh, in the unselected controller are at the same value as the output of the selected controller. So when you do switch from manual to auto, the, the process doesn't get all silly on you. Reset windup, uh, again, uh, has to do with prevention of letting uh, a signal saturate, um, which is which is a problem. So when one signal is not being used or it doesn't have anything, any feedback to counteract it, it goes into something called reset windup, which we discussed in third year, which was a problem, which needed to be addressed. So when we configure, we can address that. Uh, and it doesn't do it in this diagram here, but we do it with something called uh, tieback. And that's something we'll look at when we start talking about DCSs. Okay, uh, another provision, disabling the decoupler, so turning it off and on, so manual, on, off, auto, usually all part of one, uh, one setup. And then, of course, tuning, um, you know, put the values that we calculate into the, into the block. So that's all part of the configuration and setup. Okay, nonlinear processes, special note here, uh, and we kind of say this all the way through, we talk about things theoretically being linear because it's easier but not all processes and in fact very few are linear um, transfer functions change we know this a loop is operated outside the tuning range it can behave badly that's why we always try to tune at the, uh, at the output level um, that we are typically going to be running in because we know the characteristics at 80 percent or 90 percent or 100 percent where you run your plant that's where we do our test that's where we get our test values from and that's where it's going to perform best. Anywhere outside of that area, you're relying on linearity uh, to maintain that same type of control. Uh, what does that ultimately mean? It means if they are robust, they can handle some nonlinearity. But if the relative gain pairing is a big number, then small changes will have a big impact. Um, and if that is the case that you find yourself in, that loop is too sensitive, then you have to go back to some third year theory and detune it or use partial decoupling or use a uh, uh, the detuning strategies without talking about the third year. Um, long story short, again, kind of next level stuff. Okay, what is partial decoupling? I mentioned it here using partial decoupling. Uses only one decoupler, uh, the one that has no effect on the most important measured variable. Uh, it's about a paragraph in the ILM. I'm not going to elaborate on it. Um, but if you look at a composition uh, loop diagram, for example, uh, where we have a transmitter measuring composition and we have a transmitter measuring flow, one of those two loops is going to be more important. Probably the, probably the composition one would be my guess. Um, 
So you're going to want to use um, the one that doesn't have an effect on, on composition. To me, that's kind of like turning it into ratio, if you ask me. And maybe that's a good way to look at it. I don't know. Okay, so what's the summary here? Multi-loop processes can have loop interactions, and most often they do. Static gains that we calculate from open loop matrices or matrices are required to calculate the gain values for the RGM. The RGM is used to determine proper control loop pairing and determining the severity, telling us whether or not we need a multivariable strategy. And depending on the response required, a multi-loop strategy tuned with or without decoupling. So that's it. That's probably the worst ILM uh, in advanced process controls. So um, I hope you agree with me when I say that's probably a good idea we do that third rather than first. So stop recording now and we'll answer any questions you guys have.